Welcome. Thanks for being here on this rainy night. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new people here, so I want to welcome you to the eighth floor, which is the exhibition space of the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation. I'm Sarah Reisman. I'm the executive and artistic director of the foundation, and I'm pleased to welcome you to Aruna D'Souza, writing in the reparative mode. She's the 12th AICA USA Distinguished Critic. It's the 12th Distinguished Critic lecture um, in partnership with the Virilis Center for Art and Politics. I'm gonna be really quick, but I just wanna say for those of you who are here for the first time, the eighth floor is the exhibition and program space of the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, which is also in this building, not to be confused with the Rubin Museum, also in the neighborhood, um, or 7 West 17th Street. <laughs> um, thank you for this, for those of you who went there, thanks for making the journey. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, the Rubin Foundation is focused on art and social justice. And of course, we owe a great debt to Karen Quoney and her work at the Virilis Center for Art and Politics. Um, and what we do is we make grants on an annual basis through an open call. Um, we're, we'll be announcing the 2019 grantees in January. Um, we also do exhibitions, as you can see here. We're in an ex exhibition, public programs like tonight's talk. Um, so tonight's event takes place literally within the current exhibition, Sedimentations, Assemblage as Social Repair. Reparative mode, repair. So this is a group show featuring artworks by Alana Herzog, whose work is over here and behind you. Um, Roberto Vizzani has work in the back and in the front. There are artworks that are cast guns, decommissioned guns. Um, Meryl Laterman Euclides right behind me. How nice is that? Uh, touch sanitation and many others. And so I invite you to look around afterwards. I think there's a reception that Virilis Center's um, organized. Um, I'd like to mention that our next exhibition is Revolution From Without, which opens on January 17th, featuring works by Tony Koch, Dred Scott, Rax Media Collective, Sto Delat, Camila Janan Rashid, and others. I hope you can join us for that and for events related to the exhibition. If you're here somehow indirectly and want to get on our mailing list, there's a book behind where William is standing, who's work closely with the Viralist team to do this. Um, before I hand off the microphone to Karen Quoney, I wanna thank the Viralist Center for doing this here. It's really um, feels like a nice kind of partnership for reasons that Karen will explain. Um, but it, it couldn't fit better within this exhibition, which is really looking at the way in which artists are slowly reversing, repairing uh, ecology and, and sort of in small gestures, uh, through their work using found materials. Um, and that's something that as you go through the show, if you take time for that, if you have time for that, um, you'll see. Um, and so Vera List, we have a longstanding relationship having um, awarded one of the first art and social justice grants in 2016 for the Global Indigenous Program, which was very important. Um, so it's great that you're here. I'm gonna invite Karen to come up and just welcome you and introduce uh, Aruna. So thank you for being here, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. It's really absolutely wonderful to be here. And there are many reasons for them. One of them is this long-standing partnership with the eighth floor and with Sarah Reisman. Also to be in this exhibition, as Sarah mentioned, there is an opportunity to see the exhibition after the talk and really mingle and linger for a little longer with us and among us. Um, it's also for us a particularly joyful opportunity to be here because the reason, in fact, is of course the partnership and of course this lovely exhibition, but it's also the fact that we had approached the eighth floor as a partner, as a refuge, as a shelter for a program that could no longer take place at the new school. We thought it couldn't take place at the new school because the graduate academic student workers had threatened a strike after negotiating with the new school administration for a year, it seemed like the strike was really going to happen and it would have started today. And so, um, thanks to Sarah, we immediately could find this alternative space and are delighted to be here. However, on Wednesday, actually, I think it's fair to say against expectations, the new school leadership um, agreed to the conditions put forward by the, by the students and we're thrilled. And I see quite a few new school faculty members here. So um, we're thrilled to be here for all of these reasons. And with that, um, just a word about the partnership with ICA, which goes back maybe 10 or 15 years where once a year we've been invited to work with the International Association of Art Critics in presenting the Distinguished Art Annual 
critic lecture and have done so um, in close exchange with Amai Wallach, who is a board member of ICA. She's also a filmmaker and a critic and a writer. And it is in fact her who's going to introduce now Aruna de Sousa. Aruna's work um, has accompanied many of us, faculty, students, writers, artists, critics, whoever is here, and I couldn't be more grateful to have this opportunity to hear you. But now let's hear it from Amai, and thank you to Aika, and many thanks to the eighth floor and Sarah. And we're very happy to be here. Thank you for the shelter in a storm, literally the shelter in a storm. We've had a wonderful relationship with um, the Virilis Center for Art and Politics, and we ex look forward to having a wonderful relationship with the eighth floor as well. Um, I think that there's not a ne too much of a necessity to say much about ICA because it's in the program and there are more programs if you don't have one. But um, we were formed in 1950 as at a time when Vo voices of criticism of free speech had been for many years silenced in Europe and were coming back. And um, we have 65 member nations and we still are about spreading mutual understanding about art and freedom of expression. And one of our two presidents, we have co-presidents, Judith Stein and um, Norman Clayblatt, and Norman Clayblatt is here. Uh, and, um, you know, this has been a wonderful program for 12 years. We started this program with Michael Brenson, who was a voice of reason and morality in the art world. And um, we've discovered that as time went on, more and more of our speakers are once again um, concerned with social justice and political ideas in, in, the, in the way of the Virilist Center. Um, <laughs> And, but most of all, what's very interesting to us is the, the breadth and the depth of voices. There are so many ways to express critical ideas. Um, last year we had Paul Chat Smith, who is a curator at the Museum of the American Indian, wrote a book called Everything You Thought You Knew About Indians Is Wrong, and um, was able to write about tragic, important, universal events that shaped America and were sh and and in which in which America was shaped by with enormous humor and irony and the gifts of a fiction writer one of our um one of our um writers was um uh um I am, I'm being an old person, a Linda Nochlin and I just have to read you a little bit of what our current today's talker is going to, had said about her. Aruna D'Souza said um, that um, she, you just knew she chose a word because it rolled around on her tongue. Just so. Her eccentric but never improper play with punctuation was that so that a, a phrase read exactly the way she would have said it out loud. She loved the word trope and she loved tropus. Um, and Aruna D'Souza's voice is actually quite different. Aruna D'Souza writes about issues that are very often in the forefront of what, what people are arguing about, but she comes at it from absolutely every direction she can. She probes it, she thinks of another way to put it, she questions what anybody has said, she questions why they have said it at this time, and she, in, a, in the most roundabout and the most thoughtful and complex way, chews it on her brain and comes up with another way of saying it, and another way of putting it in a context that, that, that makes us rethink it, and perhaps rethink it in a way that we can go forward. Um, I just, for instance, um, wanted to read um, something she wrote, and I don't have it on top. Um, I found her most intriguing uses of this strategy uh, between some nonchalant parentheses she chose for her Paris Review article on art, race, and protest um, in 2018, in May of 28 for the Paris Review. This is the beginning of the parentheses. 
parentheses, if we measure the strength of an art world controversy by how deeply it penetrated into public consciousness, I'd say Whoopi Goldberg telling the protesters they needed to grow up on the view ranks this one pretty high. Zadie Smith chalking the controversy up to the cheap binary of us versus them politics in Harper's Magazine, and Coco Fusco writing off not only Hannah Black, but the historical black arts movement in hyperallergic were also telling matters, telling markers, and that's the end of that parentheses. And therefore, in her own words, here is Aruna D'Souza. Um, I've been convinced to sit, and I hope that um, I can uh, keep the attention of those people who don't have seats. There's some open space over there if you want to sit down there to be comfortable. Um, I'm just buying time to get over the graciousness of the introduction, which has touched me very much. And I want to thank everyone from ICA, from the Vera List Center, and from the Eighth Floor and the Rubin Foundation for um, making this happen and uh, being so welcoming. It really is an honor very much beyond words. Um, I was thinking earlier today that I feel a little bit like Barack Obama being awarded the Nobel Prize at the beginning of his first term, that I haven't actually really done the necessary work to deserve um, the honor, but I will see it as an impetus to do better, um, uh, to live up to whatever potential I might have. Uh, criticism uh, for me is actually a very new thing. Most of the work that I, that you may know from, of me, has been produced really very much in the last two years, uh, which I consider very much a, a break from what I had done in the previous however many years of my, since I received my PhD in art history in 1999, which is like five million years ago now. Um, but I consider what I've been doing for the past two, two and a half years uh, a very different trajectory and uh, a very new um, thing for me in my, um, in my life and my thinking about writing. I got my PhD in 99. I was a student of Linda Nochlin's. I still am a student of Linda Nochlin's, um, even a little over a year after her passing. And in about 2012, I decided that I was going to leave academia. Uh, and the reasons for that were many, and every time I tell the story, there's a different reason that I come up with. Um, but one of them, and one of the big ones, was that I was finding it increasingly hard to reconcile the idea that I shared with so many of my fellow academics that our work was somehow political, even though we spent so little time translating the politics inherent in our analysis of art to transforming how universities operated to create or perpetuate the inequalities that we were railing against when we talked about the visual. For me, the breaking point, strangely enough, was the um, scandal at Penn State around um, the abuse of young boys by the football coach. And realizing that as I read about this scandal, realizing how many committees had signed off or participated in the cover-up of that scandal and on how many of those committees faculty members served. And I didn't see that as a form of judging other faculty members, I saw that very much as a reflection on myself and my ways of participating, I'm sure, without thinking in other ways in which the industry in which I worked was, was, was enacting these same sorts of um, injustices. I was no different, right? That's, that was my takeaway. And that was a real moment for me of thinking about what my role as an academic had been. I talked about race, class, and gender in terms of 19th century and contemporary art, mostly European, but also quote unquote global, as we talked about at the time. 
But I had no real idea, especially when it came to race and class, how these forms of oppression were structuring and determining the lives of my students every single day. I, my excuses were lame. I had a Canadian's misunderstanding of how class and race operate in the US, the particular histories, legacies, and so on. I grew up, um, I, I grew to understand in this time that I knew so little about the country that I had moved to as a grad student, I thought temporarily, and accidentally stayed in 20 years or more. But my Canadianitis was becoming increasingly uh, uh, inadequate excuse, an increasingly inadequate excuse for my ultimate ignorance. This was combined with my South Asian misunderstanding of how the racism I experienced and my capacity to succeed despite such racism was qualitatively different from the pervasive anti-blackness that st structured US society. The racism I experienced may have stung as much, may have knocked me down a few times in my career, but I had privilege that I could not yet see, especially given that I was working in a field, academic art history, in which I was often the only person of color in the room. I remember with shame the encounters I had with students at the mostly public universities at which I taught. The blindness with which I imagined the barriers some of them experienced, the ignorance about the financial and social constraints that prevented them from turning in a paper on time or staying awake during class. It was arrogance, pure and simple. I still blush. This was all accentuated, my feelings of having failed in some very fundamental way at what I value most about myself, in other words, my capacity for empathy and understanding, because my decision to leave academia coincided with the murder of Trayvon Martin, an event that ushered in what is going on six years of heightened activism around state-sponsored or state-authorized executions of unarmed black people. As I began reading more and more about the ways in which white supremacy has been institutionalized in the US, including Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Case for Reparations, a devastating accounting of the ways in which the consequences of slavery didn't end with, the eman with emancipation, but rather continued over generations to strip wealth and therefore the capacity to access the very basic rights and institutions that many of us take for granted, from black families. I began to feel my failures as a professor more acutely. At my best moments, perhaps, I did nothing to make the situation worse, but I could point to very few ways in which I had actively worked to undo it. I realized that I didn't like who I was as an academic. I wore the mantle of intellectual authority poorly it accentuated all the wrong parts of me, like a dress that doesn't suit my figure. No dress suits my figure. So I decided to leave and become not an art critic, but a writer. A writer of what I did not know as yet. I enjoyed writing on Facebook, which is, or at least was, a kind of microblogging for me. I enjoyed learning different genres of writing, marketing copy, journalism, speech writing, ghost writing, food writing, all sorts of writing. I wanted to find a landing spot for myself where I could think of writing not as the production of finished ideas, but as a sandbox for working out thought, for allowing ideas to remain in play, where judgment could be suspended in favor of weighing ideas. I wanted writing to be a form of brainstorming, of posing questions rather than asserting answers. Art criticism, was not an obvious place to land, given what I wanted from writing. Though there are many ways to be an art critic, many voices one can adopt, judgment is sort of baked into the form. But having stepped away from art writing for five years, during which m my most public forms of writing were fluff pieces for the Wall Street Journal, entries in my food blog and Facebook posts, a number of generous folks stepped in to lure me back 
including Franklin Sermons and Catherine Morris, who asked me to contribute to catalogs for their individual shows, and most importantly, Margaret Sundell. I refer to Margaret as my fairy godmother, and I mean it. She changed my life. Margaret asked me to become a regular contributor to her new venture, Four Columns, which was conceived as a space for criticism, passionate and partisan in the Baudelarian formula. Anyone who knows her knows she is a formidable editor, one of the best in the business, as far as I can tell. For me, writing 1,000 word reviews for four columns, the most impossible length, one that requires your thoughts to be interesting enough to sustain interest and precise enough to express them in not that many words, seemed a worthy challenge, especially with the prospect of an editor like Margaret. The past two years have been a virtual MFA in nonfiction writing for me, thanks to her relentless, I mean rigorous, red pencil. But while I was not going to give up the chance to work with my old friend, I decided I had to think about how I was going to do it without slipping back into old bad habits and with the awareness that my political commitments to racial justice required that I could not speak from a comfortable position, that I had to put myself at risk in whatever way in order to make a positive contribution to change. Now, when I say risk, I speak in a modest way. I'm not talking about the kind of risk that the people on the front lines of a Black Lives Matter protest take. I'm not that brave. I mean the risk involved with pushing myself out of my comfort zone, with making myself and people around me uneasy, with prioritizing doing right, the right thing over doing the easy thing or the comfortable thing. For those of you in the room, there's so many of my Facebook friends here, I'm much less comfortable making people uncomfortable than I might look on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I was also trying to figure out how to take seriously the lessons I had learned from reading Coates's The Case for Reparations. That after generations of stripping wealth and power, and therefore education and health and jobs and security and freedoms from black Americans, those injustices had to be paid back with interest, not by simply giving blacks what whites enjoy now, but making up for, atoning for, what has happened over the past hundreds of years. Now, obviously, I don't have the power to ensure actual reparations for the descendants of the enslaved. But I am a fan of analogy, of trying to figure out how to make the seemingly impossible work on a small but still meaningful scale. I don't have the capacity to offer actual reparations, but I do have the capacity to imagine what a reparative mode of criticism should be or could be. I should insist now that my imagining is just that. I don't think I've achieved it, but I know what I want to strive for, and maybe it's useful to map that out and let you know what my goals are for myself. Not the worst thing to be held accountable. First, while I don't have the financial resources to make actual reparations, I can devote the resources I have to make up for my own past inadequacies when it came to historicizing contemporary art. By paying attention to art practices and art histories I had previously overlooked or, when I didn't overlook them, framed in ways that did nothing to disrupt the overriding whiteness of my historical narrative. That doesn't mean for me giving black artists and artists of color equal time as of this moment forward. It means making up for my lack of attention in the past. This decision, which I never said out loud when I dipped back into art criticism, figuring it would be too self-congratulatory to announce it in advance, and I didn't want to be that person, or that it would get editors hackles up in advance, eventually became apparent to people. I was writing about almost exclusively black artists and artists of color. 
unlike black critics who are infuriatingly and unjustly more often than not assumed not to be able to write or speak to any issues that do not involve race or black artists, my propensity to write about non-white artists was treated as a questionable choice. Are you sure you're not limiting yourself? Was, is and was a question that I would get regularly as often as last week. I decided that until black critics were treated in the art world as a matter of course, to be able to speak on any topic, on any artist, on any issue, I actually didn't or shouldn't have a choice. If I was understood to be limiting myself both in an intellectual and a professional sense by writing about, frankly, the most interesting artists and thinkers working today, then I would limit myself and take the hit. Why should I exercise the privilege of breath that my black colleagues did not have access to because of the inequalities of art publishing and museum um, programming? Second, my second sort of tent pole in my reparative criticism tent. Since I was now delving into writing about art that I had because of my own failures of curiosity and education, little context for, I would have to abdicate any position of authority or judgment, the traditional voice of the art critic, no matter how gently deployed. I would have to write as a student. That means for me putting most of my effort into understanding the work on its own terms. There are so many platforms for art writing now, from legacy magazines like Art Forum and Art in America, to newspapers like the LA Times and the New York Times, to mass circulation e-publications like Hyperallergic, to smaller circulation sites like Four Columns and Triple Canopy, to the very real art critical writing that comes in the form of Instagram and Facebook posts, and so on. If I was going to make a contribution among this multitude of voices, it was going to have to be by drawing attention to work that, in my mind, was teaching me how to be an ethical and political citizen of this fraught moment in history. I rarely criticize in my, public, uh, my published art criticism, believe it or not. I am of the belief that one should only punch up and I am increasingly aware that despite my own sense of powerlessness, both because I genuinely have very little of it and because I don't really want the power that I have, it is too easy to forget my privilege. I have watched a generation of critics, people who saw themselves as bucking the system, speaking truth to power, working in countercultural modes in the earliest phases of their career, fail to acknowledge the ways in which they amassed authority by doing so, and who still write as if they are on the outside looking in, instead of being firmly and unequivocally at the center. I don't trust myself to have any more self-awareness than these often brilliant people. So I conceive my role as an art critic, perversely, I'll admit, to be more akin to signal boosting practices that I think are worth looking at and thinking about than criticizing as such. I save my punching for my Facebook feed, and then it's vigorous and mostly reserved for major museums and high-flying curators and politicians and very famous artists, targets that are definitely and most um, unambiguously up. Third, and this goes along with assuming the position of a student and writing about things that I don't yet know enough about in order to learn from them, I would have to learn to talk about my own failures as part of my practice. I think I had primed myself for this task by writing my food blog, which, though it dwelt on many different themes, spent a great amount of time narrating my failures as a now ex-spouse and parent. Not as an exercise in self-flagellation or spectacular martyrdom, but in the hopes of modeling forgiveness, including self-forgiveness, growth, and empathy. There were also recipes. <laughs> 
I wanted to be an object lesson, the subject of a grown-up after-school special. Learn from my mistakes, people. Be better than I was. I was convinced that our culture is weakened by people's inability to admit when they've done something wrong, when they've hurt someone, when they've failed. It feels sometimes, in 2018 United States, like saying sorry is understood as a sign of weakness. I have al always seen it as a sign of strength. I had to put my commitment to the test in the wake of the Jimmy Durham show, which I had reviewed for four columns during its initial run at the Hammer Museum. This was my first foray writing about the work of a Native American artist, and I relied on the show and the catalog, including an essay by the excellent Paul Chatsmith, to frame not only the art, but the controversies surrounding it. When the show moved to the Walker, long rumbling protests by Native American curators and scholars based on questions of the artist's claim to Cherokee heritage gained traction. In a Facebook group I had become in a, that I had begun in a fit of peak in 2015, when a white New York Times art critic lamented that there were no people of color in the art world, she said it to me, to my face. <laughs> the group is called Binder Full of People of Color in the Art World, by the way. <laughs> the issue of Durham's identity claims and the question of how or whether to reframe his art practice in light of the challenges to those claims was heated. I, who had already gone on record praising the show and downplaying the rumblings, took the not so great, per perhaps not surprising position in these Facebook debates of defending him so as to justify or excuse my own recently stated critical position. I found myself with plenty, in plenty of company. I was but one of the scores of non-Native American art worlders who had suddenly become experts on tribal affiliation, blood quantum, and so on based on five minutes of Googling in the heat of a Facebook argument. But thanks to the many, many Native American members of the Facebook group, I didn't actually know how many until that moment, who patiently but firmly explained the issues so that even I could hear them, I realized that I needed to say something new. That new thing would not be any adjudication of Jimmy Durham's right to claim himself as Cherokee. That was, to say the least, none of my business to decide but it was an examination of my own resistance to entertaining the possibility that this canonical artist might not belong in the canon. When I published the piece called Mourning Jer Jimmy Durham in a Canadian art site called Momus, the piece took as its conceit working through the seven stages of grief involved in reframing one's personal history of art. When I published the piece, I was surprised when someone on one of Jerry Saltz's Facebook threads called me hypocritical for first praising the work and then, after the protests became louder, stepping back from that praise. This person saw my willingness to change my mind as a sign of my refusal to take a firm stand, of my inability to stick to my convictions. I understand why it might be understood that way. Art critics are often expected to assess work from a position that is above the capricious ebbs and flows of momentary debate, especially in the outrage-fueled spaces of social media. One takes a risk of being misunderstood, changing one's mind, learning from one's mistakes, making one's mea culpa, admitting one's biases, is easily seen as hopping on the latest bandwagon, throwing one's lot in with the mob blowing in the wind. I get this. I still do it. Fourth, it would require not just writing about different subjects, but writing for a different audience. We are often trained to write assuming a generic reader. At best, someone like, someone intelligent and informed who reads at a sixth grade level and is not a specialist about art or some similar formulation. And at worst, someone who has read the top 20 theory texts on my reading list, or someone who knows the ins and outs of Cezanne's connoisseurship debates. 
or whatever. But I know that at least for me, if I ever thought once about the race of that reader, and I'm sure I never did, I would have had to admit that I, that I had assumed they were white. So well trained in the workings of white supremacy was I, even as a brown person, that I imagined that my default audience didn't even look like me. I have spent my whole life, in other words, reading art writing written for a white gaze and writing it as well, erasing my own subjectivity along with that of others in the process. And yet, I learned so much from that writing, even if I wasn't acknowledged in it. So what would happen, I thought, what would happen if I tried to write for a different gaze, for a black gaze, say? It wouldn't mean that white readers wouldn't be able to read and learn from it. In fact, it's likely that no one but me would notice the change in perspective, let's face it. But it would mean that by centering a black reader, at least in my mind, I would not only have to write in a much more mindful way when it came to issues of race and politics, but it would mean that I would be able to assume a shared knowledge of certain concepts, like the existence of structural racism, or the phenomenon of white fragility, or the weaponized use of white tears, instead of feeling obligated to justify my use of such well-established analytical frameworks. I could start at the starting line in my analysis instead of 10 yards behind it. It would be the responsibility of readers not familiar with my language to get up to speed, not mine as a subaltern voice to translate myself. Now, once again, this is my goal, not my achievement. It is an ongoing challenge with editors at the many publications I write for who are overwhelmingly white and do, and, and as a result, do demand explanation, explanations or worse, justifications of things that I think most POC readers would take in stride. And it is an ongoing challenge to myself to make sure that I have done my homework and that I am not, God forbid, non-black splaining my, to my imaginary black reader. In setting this as a goal, I have, to be open, I have to open myself to the possibility that I will get it wrong, spectacularly wrong, that I will be called out for it when it happens, that I will listen to that criticism, and that I will try and correct for it. Fifth, I would try to combine the two things that I love most, both the close read, the nuanced description of the things I see when I look at an artwork, and the bird's eye view of, in, of the institutions, power structures, and systems which frame everything we do as artists, curators, critics, historians, and viewers. Not necessarily in one piece of writing, of course. I haven't quite figured out how to make that fly. But it would be a form of writing that understood that there is no aesthetic understanding unless there is structural understanding, unless there is political understanding, unless there is economic and social understanding. My book, Whitewalling, Art, Race, and Protest in Three Acts, is a foray into art criticism that doesn't actually analyze a single work of art that makes, among its many arguments, a claim that we cannot see outside these determining factors, and that any claim that we can do so is suspect. Now, I said that Margaret Sundell is my fairy godmother. She's one of my two fairy godmothers. The other is Paul Chan, my publisher from Badlands Unlimited. Um, Whitewalling very much came about as a, as a meeting of minds between Paul and I. Um, we met one day in his office at his request. I'd never met him before. He asked for a meeting. I called one of my friends to say, you know him. Why do you think he wants to meet with me? And he said, I don't know. He's got that series of feminist erotica. Maybe he wants you to <laughs> contribute. 
and I told this to my daughter, and my daughter was like, my teenage daughter was like, there is no way my mother is going to write an erotic book of erotic fiction. And so she insisted on coming to the meeting to make sure that I didn't come away with like a, a iffy book contract. In any case, um, Paul, Paul was interested in talking about the work that I had been doing, I think, around race and institutions, and interested as well although he didn't admit it at the time, in the fact that I had been very involved in debates on Facebook around the Dana Schutz controversy at the 2017 Whitney Biennial. And over the course of the conversation, um, we came up with the idea of a book. Um, and this book was going to um, try to do two things, uh, try to do many things. One of them was to map out, archive even, the debates around Dana Schutz's open casket and its inclusion at the Whitney Biennial, despite the fact that those debates had occurred in the almost unarchivable space of social media. Putting down the arguments, mapping those arguments, making them visible, right, visible beyond our individual social media feeds. And another was to frame those debates as part of a much larger history of black protest against the museum that understood protest not as the barbarians at the gate, but as artists, uh, largely led by artists who were asking to be included in institutions that were by rights theirs, right? Theirs too. Um, and so the book takes the form of three case studies, three acts. One, the 2017 Whitney Biennial. One was the 1979 show at Artist Space, um, in which a young white artist used the most incendiary race, racist epithet in the English language in the title of his show for no obvious reason. And the third was the 1969 Harlem On My Mind show at the Met, one of the biggest and most consequential art protests in US history. What I what happened as I was writing the book, what became clear to me as I was writing the book, which, I mean, the, the, the ridiculousness of this project was that Paul and I spoke for the first time in July, and my book deadline was December. And I didn't, because I had to finish uh, Linda Nochlin's collected writings, and because, and then uh, Linda passed away, I didn't actually start writing till November. So November and December, I wrote the book. I, gave, I handed him the manuscript on December 21st and got on a plane to Paris to like for a holiday with my kid. And when I got back, it, I had the fully edited manuscript on like, December 27th or something, and I had to revise then. We spent a month revising, and the book came out basically a year after the Whitney Biennial, right? So it was, it was an extraordinarily compressed period of time. The fantastic thing about that compressed timeline was that I had no time to get mired down in my old bad habits of academic writing. Right? I, I wasn't writing a dissertation. I wasn't writing an academic book. I couldn't. I didn't have time to do it. I just wrote. So that was one of the great things. But one of the things that became clear as I was writing is the way in which all three of these episodes involved people who were white people, who were trying to act, no, not all white people, white people and non-black people of color, who were trying to act for the best possible reasons, with the best possible intentions. It was a, narr a very tragic narrative of the failures of allyship, ultimately, in all three of these cases. It was also like three episodes of really shitty things happening, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, there's only so much 
sadness and empathy I can muster when someone is defending an artist for using the N-word to title their show. Um, but it was very much these moments at which people working within institutional structures that saw themselves as committed to inclusion found that those institutions could not accommodate inclusion in any real sense or were not built to accommodate inclusion in any real sense. And so what, and so for me, the problem of course was if you're writing a book that's about the breakdown of allyship and people going in with all their best intentions and then turning out to be really bad allies, well, hello, you're just setting yourself up, right? Like you're setting yourself up for, um, to do that very thing. And so it was a very important um, project for me to try and reimagine what art writing could be in order not to simply reproduce the crimes that, had, that I was narrating. Um, and, and so the ways I came up with it were this. Foregrounding other voices, foregrounding the voices, centering the voices of the protesters, as opposed to centering the voice of my analysis, letting the analysis come from the voices of protest. Thinking about protest in relation to the possibilities of artistic intervention available to black artists vis-a-vis -vis the institutions in question. So for example, let's not think of protest as an event that is people from the outside the art world hollering at the art world, but one of the only positions made available to many people in the art world who are locked out of institutions in many ways over the course, over a long historical period. It involved not embracing unquestioned liberal values such as free speech and artistic freedom without recognizing the ways in which they are doled out unequally and provisionally by the very institutions that claim to uphold them. In other words, realizing that even though we say these are universal values, they are not in practice universal. And taking that as the starting point, not um, the ending point. And finally, naming names and taking the heat for it. That last one really hurt. If you've read the book, chapter two especially, um, I, the people that were involved on the wrong side of the issue included some of my teachers, my mentors, people who had profound effects on the, my thinking as an art historian and eventually an art critic. Um, but naming the names and, and mapping out the words, re-quoting re the words, seemed crucial to me so that we were not talking around the problems of institutional racism, but actually talking about institutional racism. All of this adds up to something that doesn't look much like art criticism, I'm sad to say. I am genuinely sad to say it because there is so much of the genre that I admire tremendously. For a while, when I first dipped my toe back into the art world, I insisted that I was not an art historian anymore, something I still insist on for many reasons, including the fact that whatever I do now, it's not very good art history, but it is good something else, if I do say so myself. But I would also insist at the start that I wasn't an art critic per se. This is pro partly because I didn't feel like I had earned the label. I was not out pounding the pavement, going to every show, traveling to international biennials, mapping the lay of the land in any meaningful sense. I was simply taking the train into New York every once in a while, writing about things that had caught my attention here and there. So, art writer, that's what I called myself. I stepped back from this position some time ago. I had been asked to participate in a private roundtable conversation of younger art critics, 
why they asked me, given that I am pushing 50 and I was at least 15 years older than the next oldest person at the table is a question for another day. I felt entirely out of place here, in part because I just didn't care enough about the definition of art criticism or the crises of art criticism or the fate of art criticism or whatever we happen to be talking about. But at one point, one of the young, white, male, straight, cis, leftist critics turned to me and said, well, what you do isn't really art criticism, it's more like advocacy. And suddenly, I cared very much. <laughs> Not because I don't see my criticism as a form of advocacy. I clearly, I do but because I damned well wasn't going to let pass the implication that all the art critics, past and present, who have written largely or even exclusively about white male and maybe a few white female artists for all those years, weren't doing the same damned thing. Advocating for a white supremacist view of the art world, that is, in the guise of objective, critical analysis. So now I muddle through as an art critic, trying to find a voice that I feel is adequate for this terrible and terrifying world we now live in, one filled with injustice and the everyday violence of anti-blackness by state and citizen alike. I don't know if this vision I have of a reparative mode of art criticism is useful to anyone but me, if I'm getting it right, or even how I would know if I'm getting it right. I think the only way that it could be considered successful is if, over time, those voices that have been ignored, that those practices that have only found their way into institutions and art magazines as a form of diversity and inclusion, rather than a real structural transformation of our institutions, a decolonization of them, to use the current language, were to move fully to the center of those same institutions, or better, if new forms of institutions grew in their place. My success as an art critic will be in my voice becoming less important, not more, as other writers so long prevented from having such platforms take over. I work for my own obsolescence in the end. Until then, I work to hold space for a different kind of art world. Thank you all so much. Um, there's some time for questions, I think. So if anyone wants to jump in. I've stunned you all into silence. <laughs> Paul. Yes. What are you working on now? <laughs> um, I well, I've I'm working on I'm wor there's four projects. Um, one of them is to get off to through through the publishing process Linda Auckland's um, collected writings on modernism. Um, and I have to say that so much of my thinking about art criticism over the last two years has very much been shaped by the fact that I've been knee deep in Lyndon Auckland's writings for that um, time as well. Uh, and I was working on it right up until I started writing Whitewalling. So that's one of them. Another is um, a book of collected writings of Lorraine O'Grady. Um, who was, uh, who is a fabulous writer and analyst as much as she is uh, an artist. And can I say the other thing? And um, uh, Catherine Morris and I are uh, also, uh, as part of my Lorraine O'Grady Orama over the next year and a half, Catherine Morris and I are co-curating a, a retrospective at the Sackler Center of her work. <laughs> 
So um, that's one. Another is a book that, despite my own personal um, appreciation of my capacity for empathy, is called Against Empathy. Um, and it is a, a, a polemical uh, you know, piece, short piece, so, short book, I think, uh, around the problems of centering empathy and individual affect at the center of political transformation um, in a way that displaces uh, collective action. And the last is a book that was suggested to me by someone very brilliant, um, that, uh, which is structured, uh, which is a sort of um, mashup of Rilke's Letters to a Young Artist and Tahini Nahisi Coates's book, which is uh, a recent book, which is uh, Letters to His Son uh, around racism. And this is a book that would be um, le letters or essays to my daughter uh, about being an ethical person in the world uh, focused around a series of uh, art projects projects um, and talking about those in relation to questions of how one not just practices um, one's politics and ethics, but actually um, passes them along. So those are my projects. So thank you for asking. Okay, I thought you were talking to someone else. No, all right. Um, okay, hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, Arun, if you could speak a little bit about uh, to what, if any, extent Eve Sedgwick's work, um, particularly in touching feeling around reparative readings and paranoid readings, which is a, an interesting range of political issues that she engages and and the uh, and so that might just be yes or no yeah. but um the other thing i wanted to ask you and i have not so this comes from ignorance i have not read white walling but i was curious in your research how many of the survivors of action against racism in the arts you were able to speak to so um so first of all i'll say that i i don't know eve sedgwick's writings on reparative and uh, reparative modes of criticism. So um, that's something for me to look at. Um, I, you know, I will admit that much of what I'm talking about today is coming from a very intuitive place rather than a very scholarly one. So, you know, that's that's one thing to say. Um, in, in terms of the book, um, I, uh, I, I spoke to some people I didn't speak to as many as I could have because of the um, brief window I had to write the book. And because of another problem, I relied very little on interviews and almost exclusively on the written record. Um, Artist Space had kept, uh, has kept an amazing archive, in fact, of every piece of correspondence that um, every, you know, article cut out of an independent weekly newspaper every you know that all of these newspapers who that have long since gone out of business and whose archives have disappeared they've kept an amazing record and almost every part of the debate was 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 recorded by a letter because it was all being cc'd to very many people so there was a there was a fascinating record the re the reason that i didn't interview many people was beyond the fact that some of them have, including someone like Benny Andrews, who was so crucial to it, they've long passed away. Um, others like Janet Henry, for example, Haradina Pindell, I did speak to. But part of the reason that I didn't conduct con uh, extensive interviews is because, if, because I wasn't interested in revisionism. And I felt like there was almost no way to avoid that. And I needed those voices to stand as they were at that time. Um, and so, you know, I certainly hope that no part of my book will be read as a definitive account of anything. 
least of all the 2017 Whitney Biennial. What I hope that book does, what I hope it achieves, and what I think it has achieved in a modest way since, is mapping out the argument to the extent that other people can revisit it again and have the debates again in a way that is taken out of the speed of social media environments and now perhaps in the space of the classroom or other sites. Um, and so, you know, I, and so I would say, I wish I could have spoken to more of the actors. I will say that I would have been in a terrible conundrum of how to treat, for example, the words, the contemporary position of someone who had taken a very not great position back in 1979 and who regretted it now. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to deal with that, with what was being said and what the implications were in that moment. So I wanted to ask, first of all, I really appreciate all that you've laid out for us and um, a lot of the way you're thinking about writing and your position is relevant to some of the curatorial work we're doing here. What I wonder is, you mentioned the moment of being told you were doing advocacy versus criticism. <laughs> and I wonder, like it, maybe it, it's about who said it and how it was said, advocacy as a, pejor a pejorative term. Pejorative. And I wonder if there's a way that you can do criticism as advocacy or advocacy as criticism? Like, can they be melded I, as a hybrid? I, I think that my criticism is a form of advocacy. That, that's what I think it is. I also think that all those people who are writing yet another review of, like, the Richard Serra show are also doing advocacy. It's just not called that. Right? I mean, you know, when, when, when you write about a person of color, it's advocacy. When you write, a, write about a white man, it's criticism. Right? Like, that's just... That's just how it's structured, right? That's the biases. And I use Richard Serra as the example because he hasn't had a show in a long time. So like, I'm not like calling anyone out specifically. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, um, but yeah, like, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I think that the, the idea of neutrality, of some sort of objectivity, I mean, none of us, I mean, since postmodernism, none of us have really had that fiction, except people do still have that fiction, right? So people do still act like they're able to cut through the noise and you know see things objectively uh, you know whatever we all we all like to think we're able to none of us are right and so I think that I think that you know I'm I, I think that there's a that that there's that there's something for me very freeing about positioning myself and knowing that I am a non-expert in what I write about because it allows me to then be able to quite frankly say to myself, you're full of shit. You don't, you actually don't have the answers. And I think produce something more interesting as a result. Thank you. Hi, I, you made this distinction early in your talk about protest and, um, I think in your words, articulating that you felt the work that Black Lives Matter was doing, that was not the activity you were doing. And I'm curious if you do see your work as a form of protest or if you see the work and the questions you're investigating leading you to that that you articulated yourself not doing? So I, I wasn't, I, I don't think I was trying to say that my work isn't protest-like, but that but that the but that I didn't want to overstate the risks that I was taking. I mean, you know, I'm at the end of the day, I'm you know, I'm, I'm a mom of a teenage daughter who lives in the suburbs and takes Amtrak into the city every once in a while. I you know, I'm not I'm not putting my body my life on the line, right? I, you know, and and I don't want to overstate the effect I can have, but. Um, and so I, I just wanted, what I was only trying to do was, was, was sort of contextualizing or relativizing the kinds of risks um, that I uh, take in relation to what real risk might look at, like for, for someone who's doing more, um, more dangerous things. But also to say, 
you know, to everyone, like the, the risks aren't that big, right? Like the, the risks for me is that the New York Times isn't gonna ask me to become a regular contributor. Guess what? It's like that, vi it's like that person who goes to the, vi to the doctor and says, doctor, will I ever be able to play the violin? And he says, no, and you say, uh, oh, that's okay, because I never was able to do it beforehand. Like, that's kind of the thing for me. Like, it's not, you know, the risks, the risks are that I will continue to write in my little niche corner of the world, um, but be able to say the things that I think need to be said and hopefully um, have them find traction or relevance to, to people who will go on and then do with those things something more spectacular. Um, so for me, the idea that, you know, artists read my book, that is the most amazing thing to me, that artists read my book, um, that artists can read it and imagine doing things with it um, that go beyond what I can imagine. Um, you know, so, so I do, I mean, I do, I'm a very protesty kind of person, um, in certain ways. So yeah, I think of my work as trying to make change. Um, but, um, but I know that there are other people who will do with my work more interesting things, and that's exciting. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. There were really great thoughts. My name is Amanda, I'm a curator, and I think about a lot of things you're writing about. Thanks. But one of the, it just, it, and you, maybe you almost answered it right in your last statement about the, the, your, the authority yeah. with which you speak, is the idea that we, that we can speak with authority even if we're not so-called experts. This idea that, um, uh, you know, silo-based knowledge systems, which yeah. are perpetuated by our education system, yeah. mean that we can only speak as an expert. Yeah. And, you know, I think about people like Claire Pentecost or Critical Art Ensemble who talk about the importance of amateur knowledge and yeah. that you can speak with authority if you're speaking as an amateur. Yeah. That that research is something that you've that you've done, even if you're not the expert. Maybe you, can you <laughs> speak a little to that I, idea? You know, this is this is why ultimately my greatest writing teacher has been Facebook. Because, because on Facebook you can be an expert about anything, right? And, and, and or you can be, or you can be an amateur speaking about anything and, and still ha either have something interesting to say or if you don't have interest in anything interesting to say, generate interesting conversations. Um, I have a really good Facebook feed. People have really interesting conversations on my Facebook feed. Um, and, and they range from, any, from anything from what's the best moisturizer to use in the dead of winter, which was an epic Facebook thread, I will say, where like multiple MacArthur geniuses were writing dissertations on the proper manner of deploying shea butter or whatever it was. It was amazing. Um, to, um, you know, Israeli politics to, you know, um, you know, migration in Europe to whatever the latest art controversy is. That those, there, those, I have learned as much and I've written as interesting things in those contexts as I have anywhere else. And it's not because I have something especially expert to say, it's because there's a forum to say it in which it, there's sort of, a Facebook is in a weird way a great equalizer, right? It doesn't matter if the person I'm arguing with is like a 19 year old in art school or the fabled MacArthur genius, right? Like it doesn't matter. We're all just like spewing out our thoughts on this endlessly running Facebook feed. and. And interesting things happen in that context. And I think that my ability to think across a range of issues on that site, whether it's, you know, think about politics and social research and anthropology and art and whatever, depending on what I was reading that day, and starting to make those connections is actually a hugely productive way for me to think. Right? It's like 
it's, it helps me put everything into the hopper and come out with interesting things. And I find myself, actually, I, I Google myself way more than is seemly. But what, what is hilarious is that I now realize that as much as I think of like Facebook as like the place, or, or Twitter even worse, as the place where I'm just like throwing out like half-formed thoughts, that you know now it's the fashion for like legacy media to actually just quote tweets, right, as part of their thing. So I just found myself quoted in Apollo magazine about Martin Poirier and the Venice Biennale American Pavilion, and I was like, oh crap! <laughs> I, didn't re I should have realized before I put that down on my social media feed that it was now fair game, and I am now like being called upon as some sort of expert without knowing it. So I mean, there is like you know, it it is funny how those things sort of start to veer over. Um, but I think that there's a point at which now, I, I think I, I, I both have a great respect for people who know things very deeply, but I think there are ways in which I, I, I want to be able to say without sounding anti-intellectual, because I'm not anti-intellectual. I am an intellectual. I want to be able to say without being anti-intellectual that there are ways in which expertise has failed us terrifically. And so I am trying to find ways to talk about art that abandons that position, if that makes sense. Thank you. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, so my question is more about like your process of unlearning how to cre like to solely like create for the white gaze, and like I feel like as a student, I feel like most of the time like I'm creating or writing something, uh, my default audience is like for white people, and like I I don't even really realize how like everything I write like I'm trying to prove my humanity to white people. And so like I guess what was your process of like figuring out how to write for yourself as a person of color and not for the white gaze? Uh, I'm not sure that I've done it, but my moments of realizing that I that it was worth doing and that it was worth thinking about came from looking at artists. Like I, you know, when I look at the work of Simone Lee, for example, um, her work is, is all about making work for black women that speaks to black women and that allows other people to experience it without pretending to open itself to those other people. To me, that's an incredibly powerful, I mean, the work is no less extraordinary for that for her thinking, for her thought processes. I look at artists like um, Tamashi Jackson, um, like Caitlin Cherry, a young artist who's making really amazing sort of tech new media driven paintings. She's ultimately a painter. I, I look at them talking with each other about what it, what it could be to um, to define audiences on their terms, right? To make work on their terms. Um, I hear students talking about, students of color talking about experiencing crits in art school and having to, um, having, being asked to justify their work in ways that white artists don't often. And I, and, and, it, and I realized that in, in listening to those conversations, that was for me the moment of realizing like, you know, I, I, um, I am so fluent in the language that I speak, which is a language, as I said, that's, you know, is organized around a white Europeanist, gaze, 
um, that I often, I, I can't hear myself speak it. I can't hear my own action. And it, so it's those moments when, when I realize like, oh wait, so what would it look like? What would it look like to, to speak to the same audience that Simone's work is speaking to? Like what, what aspects become more important? What aspects become less important of this thing that I'm talking about? Um, right? What are, the boring, what are the things that I don't have to rehearse? Because I know that a reader will understand. So there's that. And then there's getting it past the editorial <laughs> stage, which is a different thing, right? Um, you know, that's a different thing. But it's for me, it's a really, it's a, it's a really important exercise, and it, and it's a very much part of my to use a very old fashioned term. It's part of my consciousness raising. So. when we feel that criticism matters that much and every line matters for the writers but also for us as readers. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Aika and the eighth floor. And please join us for reception just in the back there where we can continue our conversations. Thanks, Aruna. Thank